In this topic, we're going to be talking about vectors. While some quantities are represented fully by numbers alone, things like time, mass, energy and temperature, other quantities require us to track the direction of whatever we're measuring as well. Things like forces, velocity, displacement and acceleration, torque and momentum, and many other things require both a magnitude and a direction to be tracked. Whenever this is the case, we need to use the mathematical object called a vector to represent these quantities. Vectors have a whole bunch of uh, rules and different properties that can be used to help us solve problems that involve these kinds of quantities. And in this topic, we're going to look at how to use vectors and represent quantities using them. There are different ways that we can represent vectors, but we're going to start with what's called a geometrical representation, because it follows most logically from what I've just been saying about directions and magnitudes. So geometrically, we represent a vector, let's call it R, using directed line segments, like this line here joining A to B. Now it's important that I said A to B because it's directed in that direction. We often use bold letters, capital R, like R here, when we're talking about vectors. When we write them by hand, we'll often do that using an underline, sometimes a squiggly line, and sometimes we use some other ones as well, like an arrow across the top of the letters that we're talking about joining. So here we see a directed line segment from A to B, which we've denoted R, and we can see that that line segment is forming an angle of theta with the positive horizontal direction along here. That's what we call the angle or the direction of the vector r. We could also figure out that there would be a length along that line segment a to b. And that length you could figure out using Pythagoras' theorem, the square of the distance across plus the square of the distance up, and then take the square root of the sum of those two. And that would give you what we call the length or the magnitude of the vector. And we'll often write that in this way here, double vertical lines around the vector's name, or simply the letter without an underline in underneath it or a squiggly line or an arrow across the top. Starting to think about operating on vectors, we'll start by thinking about what is equal when we're talking about vectors. Now we know that two numbers are equal when they're the same number essentially. With vectors we have a little bit more complication added. And we say that two vectors are equal if and only if they are the same length and have the same direction. So if we add another vector from B to A oriented in a different direction, while it would have the same length or magnitude, it's not the, same direction, uh, not the same vector because it's pointing in the opposite direction. When it comes to operating on vectors, there's two fundamental operations that we'll talk about, and many others build on top of these. The two fundamental operations are addition of vectors and the multiplication of a vector by a scalar, or just a regular number. For addition, displacement offers a useful model to develop our understanding, so the displacement between points. The little diagram on the left here gives us an idea of a triangle law. A triangle formed by a vector from this point to the end of the A vector and then to the end of the B vector allows us to form the red triangle, a uh, red line on the edge of the triangle joining the endpoints, and that tells us what the sum of those two vectors A and B would be. In other words, the addition of two vectors A and B is like undergoing one displacement the A vector, and then another displacement from the end of that point, the B vector. A useful model for thinking about scalar multiplication is the model of force. Now, scalar multiplication of vectors is like magnifying or shrinking their magnitude, depending on what we multiply by. If we multiply a vector by a value k, which has a magnitude, or absolute value, bigger than 1, then we magnify the original vector. If the absolute value of k is less than 1 on the other hand, we shrink the original vector. Multiplying by a negative value is simply a, a direct change in direction. Scalar multiples of vectors are always parallel, and that can be quite useful, so it's something useful to keep in mind. To finish up this short introduction, here's a few rules that we can use from time to time. The geometrical ideas of addition and scalar multiplication tell us that the negative of an a vector is simply minus 1 times the a vector, the negation of it. Vector subtraction can then be built on top of this, so the vector a minus the vector b can be thought of as a plus the negative of b. We have what's called a zero vector 
The zero vector has, is a, an unusual one because it has no length and no direction at all. Here we have the scalar zero times a, that will be equal to the zero vector for any vector a. And whenever we take a vector away from itself, we always get the zero vector as well. Now there's some other rules at the bottom here. We can switch the order of addition. We can also change which ordering we group first. And the same things sort of apply here with uh, expansion of multiplication by a scalar. So to finish up, if you're looking at any other text or websites, check out any section that introduces vectors. See if the different descriptions that they provide can help you understand things a little bit better than this brief introduction. Of course, attempt the exercises from the worksheet that correspond with this video. And note on your cheat sheet any rules that you think might be important. If you've got any early problems with understanding this topic, make sure you get those out of the way as soon as possible.